because we're being live streamed. Uh, my name's Antonia Lloyd-Jones. I'm a translator from Polish and uh, a former co-chair of the Translators Association. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I think you're going to be very pleased because we've got some fantastic books and some fantastic translators here with very different experiences. And um, the kind of tag for this event is breaking boundaries. Mm. And if, if it, well, we could, of course, that's what translation does altogether. That's the kind of summary of everything we do. But um, in these cases, each of the translators is breaking boundaries, could be said to be breaking boundaries, and their books too. So I'm very pleased to be chairing this. I've had the glorious excuse of reading these books and, and um, calling it work. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, and this is, this event has been organized because um, on the 12th, the translation prizes will be given, as you probably know. And each of the people sitting with me is shortlisted for one of those prizes. And so we'll be talking about the prizes a bit as well. Um, and with me, I have William Gregory who is shortlisted for the Premio Valle in Clan, which is tra for translation from Spanish, for his book, which is the Oberon Anthology of Contemporary Spanish Plays. And I'll tell you more about him and more about his book in just a moment. And then to my immediate left is Morgan Giles. And Morgan is listed for, shortlisted for the TA First Translation Prize. Um, for her translation from Japanese of Tokyo Ueno Station by Yumiri, if I'm saying the name, luckily it's fairly straightforward Japanese name. <laughs> Even I can't get it. It's because it's Korean. <laughs> it's Korean. I beg her pardon. <coughs> yes, of course, I, 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 so I didn't want to seem too clever. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> to my far left is Adriana Hunter, who has translated Woman at Sea by Catherine Poulain. And she is shortlisted for the Scott Moncrief Prize, which she has won in the past. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk to William about his book, um, the Oberon Anthology of Contemporary Spanish Plays. And according to your bio, you've translated over 100 plays since yeah. 2003. Yeah. So you don't do anything else, obviously. <laughs> um, and. Um, you have worked with the Royal Court Theatre, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. with writers from Spain and all over Latin America, and your translations have been produced by BBC Radio Drama, and you have got a premiere at the Royal Court coming up this year mm -hmm. of A Fight Against by Pablo Manzi, and you're a translation editor for the online journal Theatre Times. A visiting research associate at King's College London. Do you ever get time to go out and just... <laughs> oh, I, try, I try. And um, you've got the most fantastic record of, of being the top translator of Spanish drama. Gosh. <laughs> so um, can you tell us, this is the most wonderful book with five very different plays by five very different authors. And it seems to me to give a cross-section of various Spanish issues and mm. questions across mm. a, a very broad um, range. So can you please tell us, how did this come to be? OK. <laughs> so I was trying to think about how I could tell this story without going on for a very long time. So you'll have to like <laughs> tell me to speed up. Um, uh, I suppose I should start by saying that about how it didn't come about which is that it's, it wasn't the case that one fine morning someone at Oberon Books woke up and <laughs> thought they wanted to do an anthology of Spanish plays and they would find someone to find some plays and they would find someone to translate them. Um, it was very much, I suppose, a, if that is top down, then it was a very bottom up um, mm -hmm. experience, which I'm sure a lot of uh, literary translators will be familiar with. Um, <clears throat> uh, these plays, if you like, I would say the plays sort of found each other. Um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you, your observation about them sitting together as five plays that speak somehow of, of different uh, concerns, if you like, in Spanish culture and society, because that was sort of the way I saw it too. Mm. Um, how did a wonderful introduction as well. Oh, thank mm. you, thank you. 
Yeah, it was nice. I enjoyed writing that. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, all my ideas coming out. Of um, <laughs> the, so how did, it, how did it come about? Right. So there are five plays in total. Um, four of them, before there was even any talk about an anthology, uh, four of them were already translated in full. Um, three of them um, I, ha I had translated uh, entirely speculatively by arrangement with the writer, obviously. Mm. Um, so you already knew the authors? Yes. So, so yes. So Vanessa Montfort I knew from working with her at the Royal Court. Um, so um, The Greyhound was sort of a follow-up play that she wrote. Greyhound is a screamingly funny farce, which I <laughs> highly recommend. It cheered me up no end. It's about... Um, how to adopt a greyhound or not. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, there's, there's a character who is a very right-on um, animal rights woman mm. who is ha in charge of organising the adoption of the greyhound. Then there's a couple who've been fostering the greyhound and very much don't want to give it up to a German <laughs> couple who uh, want to adopt it for all the wrong reasons. And it's the <laughs> clash between these people trying to be as PC as you can possibly be and just totally and utterly having terrible <laughs> fights with each other. Mm -hmm. It's very funny. Sorry. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so I knew Vanessa previously because she'd done some work at the Royal Court and this was her follow-up play. Um, mm. Uh, Blanca Domenech, who wrote The Sickness of Stone, which is about the legacy of, of uh, fascism in Spain and set in this sort of uh, horrific fascist uh, monument uh, where Franco is no longer buried, actually, but oh. at the time he was still yes. buried. Mm. Um, the, uh, Blanca, I knew, I had met previously through another Spanish playwright. Um, and so these are people I knew already. Uh, Victor Sanchez Rodriguez I met <coughs> at an event organised by the Spanish Society of Authors and Playwrights Association, which was specifically designed to introduce translators to playwrights. And that's how I met him and his play. And his is the black uh, comedy about a Cusco, yes. relationship falling apart on a sort of special holiday to Peru, where these people are trying to, to revive their marriage and failing utterly. Yes, also. yes, <laughs> yeah. It's very Spanish. Yeah, also. the devastating end of a relationship <laughs> on the Inca Trail. Um, so, so, by various, so by various connections, I'd uh, ar arranged with them to, to translate their plays in full um, and to see if we could find a home for them. They must love seeing you coming, these Spanish <laughs> <laughs> Yes, they see me coming. Um, um, uh, then, the, then the fourth play that was already translated was a Basque history by uh, Borja Ortiz de Gondra, which is a long, multi, it's sort of multi-generational, well over a century long epic about the effects of the Basque conflict on a one it's particular about family. How Basques hate each other through the generations and are constantly betraying and then carrying out vengeance on each other um, over the centuries, as far as I could tell. <laughs> it's relentless. Yeah, that's a way to look at it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's a great mm. play, and, it's, and Borja is like one of the most successful playwrights in Spain at the moment, and this particular play was hugely successful at the National Theatre of Spain. But it's a big play. It's a big play. It's got loads of characters, and there, was, and, uh, there just wasn't any way that I could fully speculatively translate it. Mm. However, there is a fund that comes out of Spain, um, again from the Society of Authors, which specifically funds the translation of plays... Yes. And crucially, does not require a publisher or a production company to um, be involved in any way, so a translator or a playwright can apply for this. So essentially, you had already worked on these plays, and you Correct. picked which ones should go in this anthology, and you took it to Oberon. Yes, I did, yes. yes. With the exception of the fifth play, which, was, uh, which is Julio Escalada's On the Edge, which is set on um, one of Spain's <coughs> North African territories which I hadn't translated yet. Um, to totally separately, I am coming to the end of the story. <laughs> totally separately, in the year 2017, the Royal Court Theatre committed to uh, producing a Chilean play called B by the writer Guillermo Calderón. 
On the day that this was announced publicly, I received emails from, I think, every theatre publisher in, Gosh, in Britain, is. saying, <laughs> which actually isn't many, saying, would you like to talk about Publishing B, this play that is going to be on at the Royal Court? And my reply to George Spender at Oberon Books was, well, I can't really talk you about that yet because it's early days, but would you like to talk about plays in translation in general? Mm. Can I come and see you? Right. He said yes. I rocked up at the office. I said, look, I've got these four plays already translated. There's this fifth play which would go with them really well. By the way, the Spanish Ministry of Culture funds the publication of translations. So can we apply for some money to translate this fifth play? And if we get it, can we put them all together into an anthology, please? And he eventually said yes. A perfect example of a translator putting the whole thing together and making everything happen. Somewhat, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So it's, sorry, that's a... Very, that is direct, not the short version. And you direct as well. And a little bit, And you used yeah. to be an actor or still yeah. an actor sometimes. You ever, do you ever stop being an actor? <laughs> 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 I don't. Uh -huh. um, so um, can you tell us something about whether these plays are going to be performed mm -hmm. and about the rehearsed readings and performances? Mm -hmm. What are the future plans? Sure. So um, what I can say is that some of them have already s had a life or are having a life. So there's an organization that I'm part of called Out of the Wings, which specializes in researching and promoting theatre from the Spanish and Portuguese speaking world. And that has a festival every year of play readings. So The Sickness of Stone and Cuthgo were actually performed at that festival. Uh, Cuthgo then actually off the back of that got a full production at Theatre 503 over in Battersea mm. uh, at the beginning of about a year ago, actually. It was just about a year ago that we um, that, that, that that production opened. Um, as to what happens next with these plays, um, at present, um, I don't know. I think the the hope with with this publication, one of the hopes with it, is that it gets into places that I, on my own, as a lone ranger trying to promote these translations, can't get. Um, there was nice. actually a, a rehearsed reading of Cuthgo in New York in December, and that did arise literally because the, the organiser of the festival found this book in a bookshop in New York wow. <laughs> and liked the play and, and decided to pick it up for this festival. So um, it's, I, I guess, one of the great things about this anthology having happened is exactly that. It can, you know, it's been spotted in the bookstore of the Sydney, of the, of, of, how, of the, the, the theatre in the Sydney. How plays actually published before they're staged? Because I thought Hardly generally, ever. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Generally, you can't get a play script until it's actually been on stage. Yes, um, that's, that's true. I think generally speaking, yes. the theatre publishers in the UK will, you know, like me getting that email within hours of it, the Royal Court announcing it, um, that's the pattern normally. A, a, a theatre commits to a play and then a publisher comes in and publishes the, right. the, the, the play text, um, which often is uh, offered in lieu of a programme as well. So this model is pretty rare. That said, uh, you know, in, in, in Oberon's defence, this Spanish anthology, the reason why I felt emboldened to propose this um, was um, that they'd already published an anthology of Brazilian plays and one of French plays and one of contemporary Greek plays. So they were booking the trend, really, in the sense of <coughs> co taking an interest in publishing international mm. theatre, on the, not on the basis necessarily of, it, uh, of there being a production to, to sell the books off the back of. So um, there, th th there are exceptions, but yeah, you're right, it is, it's normally the case that production and, comes first. And these yeah. five authors who are all um, contemporary, mm. have they've all got quite a long record already of, they're all pretty well established, yeah. is that right? Yes, is to it, varying degrees, yes. There's two of yeah. them are women. I was wondering, um, thinking of Spain, as, and there's even one of this, the Greyhound sends up kind mm. of the macho Spanish male. Yeah. Um, is it, are there many women playwrights being successful in Spain, or is that... A bit in of a in increasingly so, yes. Right. Yes. Um, I mean, like it, like in like most places, you know, there there's there's severe underrepresentation. Right. But um, I would say, you know, there are writers like Lucia Carvajal, for example, who's doing extremely well in Spain at the moment, um, and people like Eva de Redondo, who's really good, who I'd love to translate. Yeah. Actually, um, I think it's. And it I hesitate to make sweeping generalizations, mm. uh, generalizations about attitudes in Spain to gender. <laughs> um, so it's a quite hard question to answer without um, uh, doing down 
And is it a good effort, terribly so difficult to, to get situation. things staged in this country or in the States? I mean, is it quite rare to have translated plays? Uh, yes. It seems to me to be quite hard work in that yeah. what, what we always get presented with is uh, plays that have been translated by a, a student and then some famous playwright has come along and put their name on it and tweaked it here and there and basically ruined it. And then <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare as told by, I mean, Chekhov as, as written by Tom Stoppard or something. Yes. So. Um, it, the answer is yes, it is very hard. I'm always reminded of what Chris Campbell, uh, editorial director of Oberon Books and as translator of plays himself said, which is that it is really hard to get any play on. Uh, and right. I think, um, <laughs> Whatever. I, depending on sort of what mood I'm in, I can sort of feel very hard done by, or I can sort of understand the fact that I'm operating in what is an extremely saturated <laughs> industry, mm. root translation or no. So th it's right. already really, really hard. I think it's that little bit harder yes. if, if, if we're talking about translations, and, definitely. And did yeah. you have, what were the challenges translating these? Because mm. uh, the Basque play is full of bits of Basque and you yes, must have had to yeah. make some decisions about that. Because here's a set play about the Basques who are these fierce um, nationalists mm. um, doing each other mm. in even, mm. um, who... Uh, well, not all of them. And the, but the play is in... <laughs> well, there's, there's a few of them left on the stage at the end. But, but the play is essentially written in Spanish, but with yes. a great big peppering of Basque. Yeah. And yeah. you've chosen to leave it, but it's there in English, so you do know what's going on. Yeah. But, but you must have had some... had to think about... the deci There must have been quite hard mm. to decide. So, were yeah. there language issues in <coughs> translating these plays? So, with, with that, that's quite interesting because, yes, the original play does have a lot of Basque in it, actually, but for the production in Madrid, it premiered in Madrid, uh, even there, a lot of the Basque was translated into Spanish because only Basque speakers would understand it, and there are whole, there are whole tranches where... Really, if you don't speak Basque, you won't know what's going on. <laughs> and so, but, but, what's in, but what's interesting is that Borja had already made those decisions for the production in, 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 in Madrid. So I think what happened with the translation was sort of an extension of decisions that he'd already made. So he and I just had conversations about how to manage that in a translation that I suppose envisages being produced as is. So what, what we ended up doing was um, making decisions on a case-by-case -case basis about which, tr which bits of Basque right. to translate into English and which bits to leave in Basque and where we left it in Basque to footnote it, the, tr the English translation, but vice versa as well. So where we'd translated it into English but the original original had been in Basque, we put the Basque in as a footnote. Yes, because it does work yeah. the way you've done it. I mean, it, it, it <coughs> reads okay. Yeah, we tried to... We tried it gives to, that flavour. We tried to sort of find a certain logic whereby w was it reasonable to think that in, the, in this moment, in this, in this moment of the scene where the, character sudden, where the characters sw switch into a different language, is it reasonable to think that what the characters are saying could still be inferred either by the gesture, either by the response of the next person who speaks. You know, there are some quite convenient lines where someone says something in Basque and, and then their interlocutor repeats what they said in Spanish yeah, in a questioning, help. angry way. <laughs> yes. You know, so... Um, uh, so it, and then we, there's yeah, the acting yes. to help you over that too. Well, exactly. You the could, if you say yes in Basque, yeah. you can nod. You know, so, 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 there's, <laughs> there are, which, so there's... So hopefully we've struck that balance, but um, there's the option to... Yeah if you're producing it, to remove or add more Basque I was imagining that when mm. you've translated a play, if you're there directing or uh, you're involved with the rehearsals, presumably there's a certain amount of tweaking going on mm. when you're actually... Yes. Does that happen quite a lot? Yes, it does. Lucky creature. Yeah. Wouldn't you um, just <laughs> go back and change? I've known, oh. I've known people be doing... Uh, we did some readings for the Man Booker International last year, and um, someone who will be nameless was reading their text and changing it as she read it out <laughs> on <Wow>. stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know who that was. Yes. <laughs> no. um, um, okay. It does, but I think there's something about publication that, um, that uh, is... 
obviously it's it's never it's never final. Can we ever say a translation is finished? No. no. <laughs> but I think there is a for me knowing that this publication is going to happen means that I think that the text that goes into this book has to be as to quote uh, the great theatre translator Kate Eaton. Uh, has to be oven ready. Like it, it, it has to be. I know that's that's been tainted, <laughs> but Kate Eaton got there first. Um, talking about translation, uh, theatre translation, um, and um, it's yes. Yeah, so you may tweak, but these are not in the state that they would be in if right. I was going to um, a rehearsal for the first paper. time. And indeed, yeah. some of them have been road tested. So Kuthko yes. and and ah. on and. Um, the Sickness of Stone had already had rehearsed readings by the time that we uh -huh. went to press, so yes. that nuancing had happened. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, in terms of just how many times I reread it over and over and over again, compared to how much I would do before the first day of rehearsal, compared with knowing that it's going to press, to, you know, then again, it, I think it's they've had a, 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 a high level of scrutiny from me that right. I'm as happy as I can possibly mm. be with them before they're going in the book. into the book, yeah. yeah. And, and um, lastly, what does the shortlisting mean to you? Is that oh, gosh. extraordinary for somebody translating plays doesn't usually get shortlisted for prizes, or is, is that the first time that's happened to you? Uh, it's the first time it's happened to me. I don't <laughs> know if it's the first time it's happened to anyone. Um, I think that... Um, you get listed for different sort of prizes, for, for dra drama production. Well, I'm still though. waiting for my Olivier <laughs> Award. Uh, <laughs> there isn't an Olivier Award for Best Translator. What's going there on? There should be. Now, there's I something in the, to campaign All in the fullness of time. Um, Translators Association. <laughs> I think that... Um, I think there's a few things. I mean, obviously, personally, it's, you know, it's, personally, it's great. You know, it's very gratifying. Hopefully, it means more people will read the book. <laughs> Name recognition, all of, you know, all of that good stuff that any, any shortlisting in any award gives you. Um, um, but I, I do think, it's sort of broadening it out a bit, you say, is it extraordinary for a, th for a <coughs> theatre or a place to be shortlisted for an award like this? I think that I, I am really... I, th I think what it what it means to me is right going back to sort of when I first uh, encountered or became part of or joined the literary translation community, uh, which was about seven six or seven years ago now, when I really started mm. sort of coming along to events and getting involved in in, in ETN and so on. Um, I think it felt that theatre obviously was present, but it didn't really feel as though theatre translation and theatre translators as such were fully integrated into, into the community. Um, and as those years have gone by, uh, those of us who translate plays have been more present on panels, more, hear, more present yes. at, um, at ITD, um, mm. uh, and increase, you know, prizes that used not to accept plays now do accept plays um and so on and so forth That's so really i think what what it means for a theater translation to be in this shortlist is it sort of feels that that there's it's a further affirmation that that trans that theater translation is is part of this uh, and then he said metier. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Profession, um, and I and you know, and I hope it it's will. I hope it will encourage more translators to translate we, plays we, more. We know a few languages. Okay, <laughs> I know. What I, that, when did I last say that word? I don't know. Um, I hope it will. Trans, you know, encourage more translators to translate plays. I hope it yes. will encourage more um, publishers of plays to publish translations. I hope it will encourage those publishers of, trans of plays that happen to have published translations over the past 12 months, of which I can think of few, <laughs> to enter their yes, translations excellent. into these prizes. Because um, it's all very well the prize is opening their arms to, to publish plays, plays if the editors the don't actually put them in. There's a yeah. boundary breaker for yeah. you, if <laughs> ever I heard one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, uh, moving on to Morgan. Um, Obviously, because you're shortlisted for the TA uh, First Translation Prize, you are what we call an emerging <laughs> translator. Which <laughs> sounds like somebody sort of battling their way out of deep water or something. <laughs> which which <laughs> is a bit like that, isn't That's it? That's pretty really accurate. <laughs> and you are from a long way off in, uh, originally, in Oakland? No. 
Kentucky. You're from Kentucky. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of those good old southern states. <laughs> well, does it count as south? No. Oh, Kentucky. Mm, it depends on your ideological <laughs> leaning. <laughs> <laughs> it's the start of the south, let's say. Yay. Um, uh, but you live here in London. I do. And um, you, your short story translation, uh, Dad, I Love You, was published in the Book of Tokyo, by, uh, published by Comma Press, by Naokola Yamazaki. Yes. Yes, did I get that sort Perfect. of more or less right? I have no idea if it's a male or a female writer, or maybe it's a they, they, right, I can say <laughs> they. That's, you can get away with it now. Um, and so... The novel that you've translated is Toko Tokyo Ueno Station. And I found this the most extraordinary book. Um, most of us have a very vague idea about Japan, if we've never been there. And we think of it as this kind of prosperous place full of frightfully methodical people who know exactly <laughs> what they're doing and who work very hard, but they're kind of um, mm. not that badly off, etc. And this just completely gives you a completely different picture of Japan uh, by telling the life story of a man who's slogged his way out of poverty and done his best to give his children a future, but then life kicks him in the teeth. Um, and he ends up, partly by choice, as a homeless person in central Tokyo. And he's, you kind of gradually realize that perhaps he's even not even alive anymore and he's a ghost mm. voice so he can see and what other people are doing and he can listen in on their conversations so he's got an extraordinary view and um, I should let you tell us a bit more about this um, I'm also interested in how his life is contrasted with the life of the emperor yes so uh, I, I refer to this as my weird little ghost story. It is, it is a ghost story. The narrator uh, is dead from the beginning of the book. Um, he is a working class man from Fukushima uh, who comes as a young adult to Tokyo to work on the building sites for the 1964 Olympics. Uh, but the money is all being sent back to his family in Fukushima and he lives a very solitary life in Tokyo, not even getting to go back home very much. And when he does, his children are like strangers to him. They, mm. they don't really know him. Um, when he's finally able to retire and he moves back to the village where he's from, um, tragedy falls. I'll, I'll just... Mm. I won't go yeah, too in depth. Story. There are a few spoilers in a, in a book where the narrator is <laughs> already dead. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't realise that immediately. So no. It's a very clever device. The way she does it is very, is very interesting. And um, and as you said, there yeah. are uh, coincidences in his life that tie him inexorably with the imperial family. He is the same age as the emperor who has, has just uh, stepped down from the throne. And his son is born on the same day as the man who is now emperor. Mm. Um, but there the, there the similarities end. Very much so. <laughs> and um, how did you come to translate this book? Um, were you commissioned or...? Hmm. I nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's very I'm rare for that to happen. I, I'd love for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it. Uh, I loved it. I, I had read some of her earlier books and mm. thought that she was a uh, fantastic kind of dark talent. <coughs> um, had she been translated before at all? She had, she had one book in English translation before. I'm not sure if it came out in this country at all, but it definitely came out in America and didn't quite hit, uh, let's say. Um, it, it found readers who loved it, um, but it didn't, didn't really make much of a splash. And that was about 15 years ago. So at the point where I found out about you, Mary, I kind of thought, oh, I don't know if anyone is going to want <laughs> to publish this. You know, Very often people think you, you get one shot with an author, mm -hmm. really. And if it doesn't make a mark on the first go, well, as you know, that's persist, not true. But persist, mm. <laughs> So uh, I, I found uh, this book, and I read it. I was 
reading a lot of books about Fukushima um, at mm. the time because I was hoping to find something that really resonated with me that related to the disaster. Mm. And this book was, it, it was it. It was the first book I read in Japanese that um, I connected with so much that it made me cry. And it's very moving. And I knew instantly that I, I had to translate this. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think any translator in the room knows <laughs> that feeling. It's like falling in love. Yeah. Um, and, and I've went on about it for ages to <laughs> other translators, boring them desperately, uh, one of whom was Deborah Smith. Uh, and she seemingly got sick of listening to me go on about it <laughs> and started a press so that she could publish it. <laughs> oh, well done. That's real translator mm. power. <laughs> Grind somebody down until they found found mm. an entire publishing house <laughs> <laughs> to publish your translation. <laughs> I don't think anyone else should do that. But <laughs> Respect. <laughs> and um, uh, are you going to read us a tiny little bit? Yes, I, I think, aren't you? Just, yeah. to, just to get some of the flavour of the ghost. Okay. If ghosts have a flavour. <laughs> With my head turned towards the sky, breathing in the smell of rain and listening to the sound of water, I realized exactly what I was going to do next, like a moment of enlightenment. I'd never used the word enlightenment before. I was not getting caught up in something and going along with it, nor was I running away from anything as if I were a sail, allowing itself to be pushed along by the prevailing wind. Suddenly, I didn't care anymore about the cold or my headache. The yellow of the ginkgo leaves poured into my eyes like paint dissolving into water. Each leaf had a golden glow that was almost too beautiful the ones that danced in the air, the soggy ones trampled on by people, and the ones that still clung to their branches. My vision was filled with yellow leaves whirling in the cold winter wind. The turning of the seasons no longer had anything to do with me, but still, I didn't want to take my eyes away from that yellow, which seemed to me like a messenger of light. I crossed the road. I took some change out of my pocket and bought a ticket. I passed through the gates at the park entrance of Ueno Station. A sign with the words, Northeastern Shinkansen Service, Shin Aomori Bound, came into view, and suddenly I thought, if I took that train, I'd be at Kashima Station in four and a half hours. But this hesitation lasted only a beat. The feeling of homesickness no longer made my heart pound or my chest tighten. A number of paths were now behind me. Only one way was left before me. Whether it was the way home or not, I wouldn't know until I tried. That's lovely. Thank mm. you. Um, I'm wondering about the translation issues, mm. because if she's a Korean-Japanese writer, um, but she's more grounded in Japanese, presumably, or does she write in both? born or? and raised in Japan. She writes in Japanese. She doesn't write in Korean, although all of right. her works have been translated for her. <laughs> and you must have had to do an awful lot of research because there's, there's a great range of things going on here. There are <coughs> Buddhist prayers. There's a whole list of redoute roses, <laughs> which is <laughs> something unexpected. There's the train map of Tokyo and all sorts of details of Japanese history and culture. So I'm just wondering, what was it like as a translator to, to, to deal with this book? What were your issues? Just lots and lots of things <laughs> research. The, the, the roses, which seem so simple uh, <laughs> when you first look at them, took me probably about a week yeah. uh, just in itself. It, it took me two days to find the actual images and descriptions wow. of the roses themselves so that I can then crib off of...
took me out for the day with um, a friend of hers who works for the council in mm. Minami Soma, Fukushima, uh, who translated the dialogue into dialect in the Japanese wow. edition and helped me a lot with understanding the dialect right. for the English oh edition. Oh gosh, so there's also regional mm. language. language. And, and he is from the area and gave me a, a driving tour of all the locations in the wow. book, pointing out, I think, the narrator's <coughs> house is up on that hill based on what she's written. Or uh, mm. It was... Uh, an incredibly moving experience because uh, something I didn't know until I got there was that um, at least one of the characters that appears in the book, the priest from mm. the funeral scenes, mm. Mm. is is a real person. She based oh. she based him on the real priest at that Did temple. Did you meet him? I met him. Oh wow! Oh, yes. And and I then went home and had to completely rewrite <laughs> all, all the things he says <laughs> because I had I had translated him as as a you know very like. <laughs> Stern guy, but he he was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh mm. no, I don't know what to do now. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. What a wonderful experience of finding mm. a book. You've had a great love affair with this book because um, you've had all these experiences as a result of it. You've made all these friends <laughs> and been to all these places and seen all these extraordinary things that you wouldn't have seen. And what does it mean to be listed for the prize? Oh, it, it means everything. I, it means more than I could possibly say. Um, <laughs> How lovely. Because to me there's no greater honor than, than being recognized for my work by my colleagues and my <laughs> union. That's, that's the best thing to me. That's very nice. Oh, well, good luck with it. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. We want everyone to win. Um, so uh, moving on to Adriana who is not at all an emerging translator, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> but has uh, been translating, oh dear, for as long as I have. because <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. old. <laughs> <laughs> it says here that you've translated um, over 80 books, wow. which is amazing. Um, I don't think I've read over 80 books. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly works of literary fiction. And that uh, you won the Scott Moncrief Prize, which you're shortlisted for again, um, for your translation of Veronique Olmy's Beside the Sea. And um, the French American Foundation and F Florence Gould Foundation Translation Prize for your translation of Electrico W by Hervé Letellier. And two shortlistings for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. But I think the most significant thing, of course, about your career is that you are now translating Asterix. <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> is the, you know, everyone's heard of that and read that. And everyone immediately lights up at the thought of that. But this is the book that Adriana's um, shortlisted for, Woman at Sea by Catherine Poulain. It's an absolutely incredible book. I couldn't put this down at all. It's about must be a very autobiographical book, it, surely. It is. Um, yeah. Very powerful, about uh, a woman who goes off, a French woman who kind of runs away from her own life and goes off to Alaska to work on fishing boats, which is her kind of rather mad dream. <coughs> She's one of those people who desperately wants to be on the very edge of everything and to feel fully alive by pushing herself to the absolute limits of endurance. And she's sort of never entirely satisfied. Um, and the result is a very passionate, I think very romantic book. Um, so, um, you know, she's, she's either completely mad or just more alive than any of us will ever be. <laughs> so um, please, would you tell us something about the book? Yes, well, I think she's running away she's running away from a, a failed relationship or a doomed relationship because there are t tantalizing references to what she's left mm. behind in France. Um, and the author, in fact, she lives a fairly harsh life anyway. She's a, a sheep farmer mm. um, in a very mountainous region in France. So it's fascinating that she made this huge leap of faith and that she really was breaking boundaries from this landlocked existence mm. Um, in a job which is, uh, you're in incredibly harsh conditions, but you're essentially nurturing animals. And she went off to 
live on a boat, so out on the wild ocean, the open seas, in order to be killing, mm -hmm. I mean, industrial quantities of fish. And they use this technique called long lining, about which I now know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, there are thousands and thousands of it. The tonnage is, is, is terrifying, and the, and the handling of, of, of the, the fish is, is very, very it's so visceral. The average heli butt weighs 150 pounds. Oh, yeah, so and people she don't realize bodily, as big as she, you. you know, she's taking <laughs> on this halibut, which weighs, mm. and she's tiny. She's got a tiny little voice like this. <laughs> <laughs> she's, and, and they joke about it in the, the book. The guys are all saying, I don't understand a word you're saying, because it's just this tiny, tiny little woman, woman with, with a lot of enormous, tiny little voice. enormous yes. blokes. <laughs> and it's a really, really macho world. And of course, they think she's not going to last five minutes. And um, <laughs> at one point, she gets a, a fish hook in, in the root of her thumb, and it goes really badly septic because she doesn't want to tell anyone there's anything wrong with her and they can't believe there is serious respect for her because they can't believe she's <laughs> she's tolerated this but she has to you know women have this a lot she has to prove herself mm. uh, 10 times more than anybody else because she's just a little woman <laughs> <laughs> so yeah a, a huge leap of faith yes it's extremely intense her whole experience and um uh how did you get to the point of translating this book? Is this a book I, that you found? No, I, was, I was commissioned. I was contacted by the publisher. Uh, not that I don't do an awful lot mm -hmm. of, oh, my God, I love this mm -hmm. book. Please, will someone publish it? And then, you know, you were saying it's like falling in love. And then, you know, it's like watching them go to the altar with someone else. When <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, they... they die a death as a singleton and you never get to marry them because so many books end up unpublished. But this one I was approached um, and it, it was a marriage made in heaven because I am absolutely obsessed with the sea. Mm. And for me, mm. one of the most powerful things that comes out of this book is her relationship with the sea. And, the, you know, the sea is... It, she loves it and it's so beautiful and it's described in every different possible state that she sees it in um, but it's also so terrifying and it's relentless and it's absolutely merciless um, and so for me that was a I, I, as I say I, I love to see my mother always used to say that I learned to swim before I could walk because mm. I just couldn't <laughs> she couldn't keep me away from it it was dangerous taking me to Water the beach baby. <laughs> yeah and I, you know the sea has tried to kill me twice really quite uh -oh. serious it's quite serious stuff but I still can't I can't stay away. So when I was offered this, it was it was just a wonderful. It was a gift. It. Yeah, a real gift. Cool. And um, it's plainly a highly autobiographical book. And that on one level, it's a bit like reportage or a diary, a memoir, but with this immensely lyrical style and lots of sort of short, sharp sentences. Um, and. Um, did you talk to the author about about it? Did you what questions I, did you well, have for we, her? Well, there was I don't think I actually talked to her in the end. I we we had email yeah. correspondence. Yes. Um, no, I did You're talk to her because I heard the little voice. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, no, it was mainly um, through email that I did change the sentence structure a certain amount because right. in French there were many, many more of those very short sentences. Right. And in English it just becomes unpalatable. It's, you can't cope um, with it. Yeah. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to use it for particular effect. Um, <coughs> also, with with the publishers, we, we had a sort of slight feeling about some of the reportage aspects. Some characters, for example, appear to be just sort of plopped in and then just left. Yes. <laughs> and... Yes, they rather mysteriously y yes, turn up, don't and they? Yes, and I'm sorry, I'm not, that sounds as if I'm being disrespectful of the book, but I think <laughs> the publishers felt possibly for the purposes of narrative drive that some characters could be culled, but she was absolutely adamant, adamant yeah. and I respected that mm. decision that it, she's painting a picture of a place mm. and a world that maybe nobody in this room will ever go to, except it turns <laughs> out that Antonia has, bizarrely, lived... I used to live lived in Alaska with a fisherman. <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> I mean, how weird is that? So so nobody <laughs> in this room might, but somebody has. Um, yes, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so she's opening up a world to us, and why shouldn't we know mm. about the couple who just dropped in one time to the, to the hostel yeah. and who were both drunk and there's a huge alcohol dependence problem in this community yeah. um, and so that that little that drop-in cameo is important to the overall picture there were things about this i found very interesting because i mean exactly you've got a book that's essentially translated for into 
British English. But of course, because all the characters are Americans, they're speaking American dialogue. Yes. And um, there are certain references which I was thinking, because I lived in Alaska, I know what the lower 48 is. Do you know what the lower 48 is? I don't. Many of you? Hands up if you know what it is. <laughs> A few people, but not very many. It's, if you live in Alaska, which is that, all the states, except for Hawaii, mm. are lower. So mm. that's the lower 48. <laughs> and <laughs> then, the others. You know, so there's yes. kind of things in there I was thinking, and it's not explained what that is, it's just dropped mm. in. And I was, I was wondering, did you kind of wonder about making the whole thing American English or explaining some of those things or just... Uh, well, there are two questions there. The, the, the sort of glossary aspect of it. In the French version, there actually was quite a long glossary. Oh, really? Um, not least because she quoted a lot of English expressions. Mm. And those, instead of having them translated as footnotes, which is incredibly intrusive, they were in the back in the glossary mm. when, she, when she quoted what, what a character said directly in English. But also, a lot of the fishing jargon was, was in the glossary. And I'm... In, in fiction, e even when it's sort of auto-fiction like this, I'm not very keen on, on that sort of thing. So mm. we tried to... What I did was, a bit like you were saying, the, 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 ed the your author said, you go ahead and you explain these things for your readers. I tried to explain as I went along what the, f what the fishing stuff was, so I would stick yeah. in a word that right. made it obvious what that was. If it hadn't been explained in the glossary in the French, like the lower 48, I thought, like, think, leave it, work leave it, it let them yeah, work it out for Alaskan themselves. But I wanted to give them the same ride as let the French reader. Let them all the swearing out, though, mind you. <laughs> 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 but I, oh. it's, it's interesting, because you've got a French person writing dialogue in French that is American English yes. of, of a particular kind. That's quite challenging. That was, yes, that was another thing, the, the British versus American English thing. Um, I was talking to Morgan earlier about there was one particular bit where uh, in this the hostel, someone was handing around a tin of biscuits and somebody said, gee, these cookies are great. So wait, no, they can't be biscuits because they're cookies. And, mm. and obviously in that particular instance, we use the word cookies in, in the UK as well. So that was fine. But there were other places places where there's this slightly queasy balance between the British vocabulary and the US vocabulary. Mm. And I did actually suggest to my publishers, I said, should we just make this American? And I do a lot of work for the American market, so it wasn't going to be a problem. But they, they said, no, right. we want this in British English. And in a way, it was quite nice because it, it, it makes the dialogue stand out yeah. more. It makes, gives it more character. Yes. And um, have so... As you love the sea, are you now tempted to run off to Kodiak yourself? <laughs> and have you been there? Or I would haven't. Would you like to go there? I haven't. I can highly recommend it. it. If you want to see bears. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I would. But it's one of the weird things about <laughs> one of the weird things about translating, and <laughs> you break a lot of boundaries. You get to travel to the most incredible mm. places, and I I have a list as long as your arm of places that I want to go to because I've done a book that was yes. set there. Yes, yes, God, yes. this sounds amazing. I want to yes. go there. So it's a long bucket list. But Kodiak <laughs> is on there. <laughs> well, you should definitely go. Go and see the good old boys mm. in the bars. <laughs> and um, are you going to read us a little bit? If you'd like or me to. Yes, please. A little bit. Yes. Just love to hear, some yeah. of, hear you read some of it. It'd be great. OK. Yeah, so you can see it's quite early on, in the, of early on in the book. Lady French Lady. <laughs> We're fishing at last. A grey dawn, a murky leaden sky overhead. A glimmer of sunlight might just be making a pale breach in the mist. And all around us, ocean as far as the eye can see. It's cold. Simon has thrown out the marker from the upper deck and then the boy. The line unwinds as we move away. The first long lines slip into the water to a roar from the accelerating engine. And wheeling seagulls try to grab our bait before it disappears under the waves. I bring the tubs to Jude, who ties together the ends of the lines, one after the other. The wind whistles in our ears. He slams the empty tugs, uh, tubs on the deck, and I immediately clear them away. My heart beats frantically. The men shout, making a catastrophic racket. Jude stands facing the churning waters, braced on his sturdy thighs, back arched, his whole body straining to match the urgency of the situation. 
jaw hard, clamped, eyes locked onto the demented beast of unspooling line, a marine monster bristling with thousands of hooks. Occasionally, a hook gets caught in the gunwale and the line tautens dangerously. In a flash, he grabs a pole mounted with a knife. Stand clear, he yells and cuts the gangion connecting the hook to the line. Last tub, he roars to let the skipper know. Dave drops an anchor and the line keeps feeding out till it comes to the last boy and marker. The boat slows. The tension gripping us instantly falls away. A volley of laughter. I catch my breath. Jude lights a cigarette. Dave turns towards me. You okay? Yes, I whisper. <laughs> I haven't recovered yet. I didn't understand what was going on at all. The men's shouting terrified me. While I run the hose over the deck, the skipper appears. And now, boys, we're fishing. Go have a coffee. We're all set. <laughs> That's great, thank you. <laughs> it's an absolutely beautiful translation. You just completely forget it's translated. Um, and what does it mean to you to be shortlisted? Because you've already won this prize. So um, did it make a difference when you won it before as a it's, translator? It's incredibly... Sp I'm, I'm a very lucky person because the, <laughs> the first book I translated, like Morgan, was actually shortlisted for this prize <laughs> a very long time yeah. ago. And that it's an incredible feeling of, you know, you found this, in that instance, <laughs> it was something I'd found and I loved and I trawled around to find a publisher. And then you get this endorsement. Mm. Mm. And with the book that won, it was a book, again, that I'd com I was completely blown away by it. It took me nine years to find a publisher wow. for it. And then it wow. won a prize. And it's, again, yeah. it's this, it's someone That's saying, you're right, you were <laughs> right. <laughs> so, mm. but, but for me, it's not, it's not so much <coughs> the, the personal thing. It's really anything that's, that celebrates and publicizes work mm. in translation is a good thing. Um, and it's interesting that you, it's very kind of you to say, oh, you know, you can't tell it's translated, but <laughs> you should never be able to tell no, something's translated. And not. I think people have this, um, there's still an opinion out there in this country, we're so spoiled, there's so much <laughs> material written in English um, that people have a feeling out there that, oh, no, I don't like stuff in translation because yeah. it's all kind of wooden <laughs> and clunky. And, bleh. and and these prizes bring more work in translation to, to the attention of pe readers who will go, well, you no, actually, you can't mm. tell it's translated. Mm. And, and I teach translating, and I always say to my students, it's just not okay for something to sound weird mm. because it started mm. out in, an, in, a rig in a different language. Mm. Yeah. So, it, yes, if the prizes help people to realise that we're flogging our guts out to make mm. it sound like <laughs> English, <laughs> then that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I recommend everybody, to everybody, that all the short lists, because it's a great way of deciding what you're going to read if you don't know what to read. Um, you never get let down by these things. It's quite amazing. There's, there are some fantastic books on these short lists for the prizes. And... Um, uh, are there any questions now for the audience? Thank you very much. Can I have two, um, very short. Thank you very much. I have one short um, information question and a, and a slightly long one too. Um, William, I'm thinking perhaps of getting a small greyhound, so <laughs> uh, could you remind me of the name of that? <laughs> it's called uh, the Greyhound. The Greyhound. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll well, find Vanessa Montfort. I'm not sure I'd uh, get one using the method uh, demonstrated <laughs> in this play, though. It's all quite stressful. Your, well, that, well, yeah, your bathroom like... might explode. I don't <laughs> recommend it. Well, your weapons. bathroom might explode, <laughs> and you might uh, inadvertently get high on marijuana without realising. So, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but then you've got to deal with your exploding bathroom, though. So, yeah. <laughs> and it might chew your Louis Vuitton That's handbag. That's true, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got several of those. <laughs> 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 my, my sort of proper question mm. was following on from the Morgan and Adriana reading so beautifully mm. from work which was probably written in silent on the page. I was wondering when mm. you're translating plays, do you sort of translate out loud because mm -hmm. the text is produced to be spoken rather than to be read off the page. Thank you. Yeah, I read out loud all the time. Um, I mean, I read, I actually read out loud, like I will sit and read books out loud to myself. Mm. I've, I've, I'm just in the habit of doing that and definitely when I'm translating plays, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking the 
lines out. Not, I mean, not necessarily literally as I'm writing them, although sometimes, but you know, as part of the process of of editing and, and, and checking it, that's definitely part of it. And thinking about, I mean, especially with plays um, that are very generally speaking in a sort of more realist, naturalistic mode, um, where you are thinking about a characterization and uh, how they might express themselves in English, um, then I find that really useful, yeah. I find myself doing, um, not just saying things mm. out loud, but doing facial mm. expressions. And, yeah, you know, when yeah. you, yep. you know what the thing means, and there's no way of looking it up. And <laughs> you just, so I sit there going, mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, he, he, you know, he was glowering. Yeah. Brilliant, that's what I needed. <laughs> and it's just because you make, you make the face, and then, <laughs> and you. Yes. <laughs> there's a whole movement nowadays of drawing everything, isn't there, when you're. <laughs> Translating. I did a no. fight Not sure scene. How that is. I did a fight scene in a, a bit of commercial work, and I, I was like in my office, like contorting <laughs> <laughs> my body, trying to figure out to how work out what they're doing. <laughs> how are they doing that? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. there's the bit with the halibuts. There's they <laughs> gut they gut the halibut on board, and it's really quite yeah. a complicated process. Yes. And then the last thing they do is they delve inside the body cavity for the testicles, and it was all yeah. anyway. Wow. This description, I had no idea whether the <laughs> knife was going round to the right and then down to the left and mm. I thought how am I going to do this YouTube <laughs> yes. it's, oh, yes. it's all uh, so I was there yeah, practically yeah. kind of touch, 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 and um, then he because <laughs> what she'd said makes perfect sense when you can when see you can when you can see, see. I've done so. a lot of fish cutting <laughs> 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 oh yes I've had blood across my face and all over my teeth just from sticking a knife into fish it sounds terrible I'm learning so many new <laughs> things about you <laughs> Um, so do we have other questions, please? Yes. Hi, um, I was wondering what drew you to the languages you translate to English from, and, um, and also what drew you to those cultures. So I guess a question for all of you. Uh, do you want to start? Yeah, really quick. I'm the product of a free education. <laughs> um, at my school, um, my school did French and German, so I did French and German. When I was in lower six, they hired a Spanish teacher, so I did Spanish. <laughs> if they'd have hired a Russian teacher, I'd be, hi <laughs> I'd be doing Russian plays now. It was as simple as that. I just loved languages. I, I did my bachelor's degree in uh, French and Spanish. Um, do you translate from French as well? Uh, I can do, but there's, you know, there's already Christopher Hampton, so, <laughs> so that's, a, yeah. that's a tough market to get into. Um, so Spanish is, and Spanish is a big language, um, so there's there's plenty, there's there's sort of plenty to to be working on, and really, I think what attracted the culture came next, if you like. I mean, literally, I, I was I grew up in Grimsby. It's not known for its multiculturalism, <laughs> and it was really the... <laughs> <laughs> and it was the la it really was the love of languages that fishy, uh, that came first, fishy. and then <laughs> all of and actually one of the beautiful things about being a translator that it, uh, to echo what you say that it sort of takes you to places that you have not been and may never be because um, God knows it's not a lucrative profession. Um, so you know it's um, that it's great the way that the culture comes to you through the act mm. of translation mm. because worlds just land on your desk that you never imagined <laughs> you didn't know existed or never imagined that you'd be accessing. So. Yay for free education. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Travelling <laughs> by, while staying at home. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, where I'm from uh, in Kentucky is home to the first Toyota factory built in North America. Mm. And because of that, there's a really strong kind of <laughs> sister city relationship with various places in Japan. Mm. Wow. And I was picked when I was 13 to go on a week-long homestay. And so I started learning Japanese a little bit for that. And then mm. when I came back, I just I kept it up because it seemed like it would be useful. Like maybe I could translate automobile manuals or something. <laughs> <laughs> what a brilliant way to start! Yeah. <laughs> what are the chances of that? It's amazing. amazing, isn't it? Do you think people in Sunderland speak Japanese because <laughs> they have a Toyota? They used to have a Toyota plant up there, didn't there they? There probably are a couple weird little teenagers like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Japanese with a Geordie accent. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was an army brat and I went to, we lived in Switzerland a bit when um. I was little and I went to a French school as a child so the French has just always been there and then I did a degree and it just 
it went from there, really. So uh, yes, it was the language came mm. first, and then the culture is on the back of it. But it's yeah, a big love affair with the language mm. for me. Yeah. It's uh, strange, isn't it? You don't imagine yeah. when you're learning how to say the pencil is red. <laughs> <laughs> that years in the future you'll be sort of doing, working with yeah. these wonderful things. It's quite something, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. Um, any other questions, gentlemen here? Uh, my position is that for 15 years I've been translating academic texts. Um, agents have never been involved, I've, apart from the very beginning, which mm -hmm. I find it hard to remember, um, I've been approached. But now I, I want to translate a novel, and I've got two or three novels in mind. From which language? Uh, from German. German. Um, and listening to the panel, I'm wondering, should I bother trying to find an agent, or should I just browbeat a publisher? Mm. Yeah? Does, um, has anyone here yet used an agent? No. 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 I think they would, they'd laugh at the dust in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of paying somebody 15% of a not very much money when you're probably doing all the running yourself yes. anyway? Yeah. The agents, I don't think there are agents who know much about work in translation. Well, I don't know. Well, and when I started out, I did go and that. talk to an agent and she said to me, frankly, who is of Polish origin, so it made sense. She's a friend, and she said, you know far more about this than I do. Mm. It doesn't make mm. sense. You uh -huh. don't need me. Uh -huh. You don't need be spending money on something. The, th oh, the thing is to target publishers who are likely to like the material you're offering them. Mm. Mm. And don't just blanket. It's not a scattergun mm. thing. It's yeah. if, 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 if you're passionate about the book and you can find publishers who you think it fits with their list or it's appropriate mm. for some reason, mm. That's the way to go, I would, right. I would say. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm. Uh, gentlemen there. I've got a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you. I was just wondering, with books that are out of copyright, are there particular difficulties to do with that? So if you're trying to approach a publisher with a book that's been out of copyright, say, for quite a while, that's of an author who died, say, like 100 years ago or so, uh, is that, does that mean it's particularly difficult to get it published? A book that's in the public domain? Yeah. Mm, no, I don't think so. It doesn't make so. much difference, does it? I th the only resistance might be, why has it not been translated mm. already? Mm. There's a sort of snobbery about, it's got to be now, it's got to be, you know, if it's, even if it's mm. two years old, oh, why didn't someone pick it up at the time? And they quite like having living authors for publicity tours, but if you can overcome those things... <laughs> so they don't have to pay any... Fee. Yes, that I think that might like be attractive. That. There are some publishers that exist to do this sort of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because my language is Chinese, and there are loads and loads of really famous Chinese authors um, who are untranslated in English, and it just strikes me that most yeah. of them are dead. <laughs> Go for <laughs> it. Long, I think it might it might be a positive thing that 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 there aren't those extra mm -hmm. rights fees to pay mm -hmm. because Absolutely. you know the margins are pretty pretty small. So any any way of saving. Yeah, and, and there are publishers that focus specifically on that sort of thing, which yeah. you should target. Um, have we got time for another question? Or are there, are there any more? Um, because if, if there are no more questions, um, it just remains for me to say thank you very, very much to the Translators Association, to Catherine Fuller for organising this, and Robin Law, the awards manager, Martin Reed, the head of communications, and Christine Adler, the office manager, all of whom have brought about this evening's wonderful event. And um, don't forget to come to the uh, prize giving ceremony at the British Library on the 12th of February at 6.15 and um, there'll be readings from some of the books and it'll be a wonderful evening so do come and thank you very much for coming now thank you